transition now into a time where we dig into your word. We stand on your promises of who you are, that despite the fact that we have failed so many times, despite the fact that the world has let us down, despite the fact that without you, the deck is stacked against us, what we rest on as we come in here this morning is that you are our firm foundation. You are the only foundation that matters. And so we, we worship you as king. We surrender to you as sovereign. And God, we would just ask that you would have your way. And we pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. Have a seat. You guys, uh, again, welcome. When we started off the service, have you guys got some chairs for me, Michelle? Can you make sure there's chairs? Um, when we started off the service, I want you to know something that's going to shock you. That thing that we did was ad lib. Right? That, that was not, I did not know. Like, I know it sounded so scripted, but that was ad lib, and so that's how we do things around here. But uh, we're excited. Again, if you, like a third of you probably were not here yet. Uh, there's young families that are bowling at 3 o'clock, and we have free child care for you. And we've been talking as a leadership team, what are some things we need to focus on? And one of those things is we need to invest more in young families because there are a lot of you, and we know that your life is hard uh, and also stressful. I want to bring something to light as we get started. Um, there is a family in our church that's been going through a lot, and we prayed for them publicly. And for the first time, at least some of them are in church today, but Miles and Steph, Miles is our newest elder. Where are you guys at? So... Uh, their son was born prematurely at one pound, four ounces. And they have been in Nebraska. They were in Sioux Falls. They have been in Nebraska. And they're hoping that he can come home at Christmas time. We don't know for sure. But I just want to bring uh, to light, as we're talking about young families, I just felt like we need to recognize this. This is their first time back in church. This whole process has been going on for months. has taken place. And so make sure you tell them that you love them and that we're praying for you. We know you love you guys, and we're praying for you. But praise God, you're, you're here today, and it's your first time back. And we know that once the family's back together, this will be, again, a weekly occurrence. So um, I just wanted to bring attention to that. The next thing I want to do is I have a good friend that I want you to meet. And so her name is Dr. Kirsten Somke. And there she is over there. Can you guys say good morning? We have to act like we're friendly around here as she comes and talks to us. Yep. If we don't, then she'll never come back. And that's awkward because... Um, She's actually my wife's boss, so we want to make sure we're friendly with her. But she is the school administrator at Aberdeen Christian. And so uh, welcome, Kirsten. Have a seat. Well, these seats are too far back. I'll put them up closer. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to hand you the mic while I climb up. I'm vertically okay. challenged, so. <laughs> On three. One, two, three. So something we've done historically is when, when there's a new leader at ACS, we oftentimes uh, bring them to before you just so that you can get to know them. And so uh, she, this is your first year, but it's not your first year in education. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, good morning and thank you. This is wonderful. Um, so I've been in South Dakota my whole life. Um, so not my first year in education. Uh, my husband and I have been married for 31 years uh, in May, and we have two grown sons, uh, Wyatt, who's actually with us. He didn't know I was going to wave at him. Uh, he's 29, and our youngest son, Brody, who's 26, he's out of town this weekend. Um, but I've worked in education all my professional life. I'm starting my 25th year. Um, in education, I began my career as, I got my bachelor's in social work, um, but quickly realized I really wanted to work in the school system. So I got my master's in guidance and counseling. Now it's called school counseling. So I started out as a school counselor, um, I wrote a program for an at-risk population. I worked as the opportunities counselor for about 17 years, and then as an administrator for um, just a little over five years. And so while I was finishing my time as an administrator in the public setting, um, I had always wanted to get my doctorate, and in pursuing what would be the best fit for me, I found this program at Liberty University that um, paralleled every course of study, every content area, uh, with a different book in scripture. And that, um, so I first got my education specialist degree at Liberty, and then proceeded to get my doctoral degree in that, specializing in administration and leadership that had the oversight of scripture. Um, so 
to me, by the time I finished that, I knew that um, that's really where I wanted to continue to serve was in schools and educational leadership, but specifically in a faith-based organization. Uh, I will say at the time, I had no idea where that was going to lead me. I just really felt that calling. Yeah. And what we all know, I know as well, is it's very easy to work in the nonprofit world and to work in uh, Christian organizations where you never know where your next dollar is coming from. So uh, that's an easy transition, I'm sure, from the public school setting. Pierce and I both have something in common. We both went to Liberty for grad school. She got her doctorate. I am not a doctor, uh, but we also went, both went to Northern and got our graduate degrees in counseling. And so there's a, there's a like-mindedness there. And I, I want you to know, I told her this before we... Uh, came on stage, that the staff there often kind of jokingly call her Mary Poppins because she's just this peaceful leader that has bring stability to the force. And so um, would you tell us a little bit more about ACS? Absolutely. So Aberdeen Christian School, um, just like this environment here, has been the most welcoming place. Uh, coming from a public school setting where I've worked for uh, 24 years and coming into ACS, that was one of the distinct things that I noticed that was different. Um, it's a very engaging, this is a, a family friendly and uh, an academic environment in which not only are we pressing into academic excellence, but at the same time honoring and making sure that we, we have that engagement and that oversight with families. Um, Aberdeen Christian School is a private school, but at the same time, it, it upholds all the tenets that families are looking for in education content delivery, um, curriculum oversight, and academic excellence. But at the same time, we are training our students um, with the input of staff and families to glorify God. We're shepherding hearts and sharpening minds, and it's just like my education at Liberty had those two components. Um, Aberdeen Christian School has that as well. Yeah, and so I, I want to be clear about you guys about something. I, I'm not bringing Dr. Sompke on stage to be like, this is the way you have to educate. Um, you know, you, it's like you can get in these evangelical circles where it's, if you're not homeschooling, you're not as close to Jesus, or if you're not going to the Christian school, I just want to present this to you. This is a school that we've always supported as, as an opportunity for you to consider what maybe God is leading our family in this direction. And so um, that being said, I think one of the big issues always for most of us is what, what do you do if you can't afford it? That's, and that's a realistic question. Um, so at Aberdeen Christian School, one of the best ways to find out more about us is to go to our website. And, um, and I have to give credit where credit is due. This website is brand new. Um, there was lots of hard work that went into it before I came on board. So if you go to aberdeenchristian.org or you can just Google Aberdeen Christian School, our website will come up. And right on there, there is a link, a tab at the top that'll say financial aid. So you click on that tab and it'll walk you through an application. So at Aberdeen Christian School, we actually have a really great funding source through, it's called South Dakota Partners. Um, and what this does in South Dakota is it allows us to be able to help families get financial assistance. So you follow that link, you fill out the application, and then it gives us as a school like a version of how we can support you financially, what you are, um, what category you may need assistance in. And then in South Dakota, this organization called South Dakota Partners will then partner that fund. So in addition to that, we also have in-house scholarships available. There are different grant funds available. Um, so really, yeah, there is a very good possibility that most families, just like if you were attending a public school and you would fill out the free and reduced application for meals, or you would uh, work with your private or your public school administrator uh, to get access to those programs, it's a little bit different, but it's a comparable source. So definitely worth your time to look at. Awesome. And they can, if they're wondering more, they can come meet with you throughout the week. They can meet Absolutely. with some of the staff. Absolutely. So and that would be just, just offering that, um, just as you were also welcoming here today, uh, this gave me a great look and a great sense at your family church home. This is wonderful. We invite you to do the same. Absolutely. Call us up. Come for a tour. Um, there are lots of interesting and unique things about Aberdeen Christian School that to be there in person, I think would give you a great perspective about that. Um, my husband and I have always farmed. We live on the family farm. And one of the things that I so appreciated when I came for a tour was that sense of family. Um, being able to walk into a school environment where it was very 
different in that if you've walked into a public school and sometimes you feel a little bit of chaos or a, a little bit of a sterile environment, this was exactly opposite. And so um, I am so grateful to have the opportunity to work at Aberdeen Christian where, where these principles are, we can have them and we can definitely, it's, just, it's sustainable. It definitely is an environment we can sustain. So I'm excited about that. Awesome. Let's stand up. We're going to pray for Kirsten. Jesus, I just uh, lift Dr. Somke up to you. We lift the school up to you. We know that through the years it's, it's survived and in times where maybe it seemed improbable that you've always had your hand on it. And God, we pray that it would thrive into the future. We thank you that as a church we've always been able to partner with them. And God, I pray for her leadership. I pray that you would give her specifically wisdom and discernment and strength uh, when her energy is low. God, that you just allow her to lead into the future. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. She will be around, and she'll be at the second service, obviously, to talk again. And so if you are just kind of inquiring about more what that looks like for your family to get involved at ACS, you can sure meet with her. Uh, but at this time, we're going to transition. Would you open your Bibles to the New Testament? Uh, we're going to be in different places. We're going to be in the Gospel of John to start, uh, but just kind of a little catch-up as to where we've been. Uh, what we have been talking about so far is that it's all of our jobs, not just to be a disciple when we come to Christ, that's what happens, but to be a disciple-maker. And the tagline has been, with this, which is in the book that I've asked you to read, every disciple is what? Every disciple is a disciple-maker. And so it's not the job for those who go through seminary, or want to be in church leadership to be disciple makers, it's all of us. And there's power in numbers. And so you want to know the history and story of new life, it's really been this idea. Our mission and vision is to simply make more disciples. And the more is the important part because the job is never done. And so this is kind of a vision casting series, but it really is just cementing the, the biblical role of the church and how the church either survives or fails. And so last week I told you there's a goal to discipleship, and the goal is spiritual transformation. It's like extreme home makeover. It's not a little different when you come to Christ. In fact, if your life looks fundamentally the same as before you became a Christian, something is fundamentally flawed. And so the idea and the goal of discipleship is spiritual transformation, that you get this makeover because the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and now all of a sudden the things that you didn't used to care about, you care about. The things that you did care about aren't so important. Everything changes when you say, Jesus, be my Savior. And when it's not different, it's because you're experiencing religious transformation, but not Jesus transformation. And I gave you a definition to walk in. The definition of discipleship is bringing Christians from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity so that they can replicate the process in someone else. And so what I didn't tell you last week that I wanted to bring to light this week as we get started is it's kind of like being a parent. And it would be the equivalent, and, and I think there's a lot of us as Christians that are guilty of this. We want to see people saved. And so... Uh, we want to proclaim the gospel. That's fundamentally true, of course, but that would be the equivalent if that was our end goal of saying, I just want to be a parent, and the entirety of the parental vision that you have for your family's life is simply to go to Avera or Sanford and have the baby. Right? So that's the starting point is your salvation, but you go from infancy to maturity, and that's where so many of us fall down. The goal of the church was never to be a location, but to be a people. And then I said this, and then we're going to move into this week. I said, there's a test to every church. Jesus says this about the church. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so the idea is that there's no plan B for discipleship. Now, there are para ministries. As much as we love the Christian school, they're going to come alongside and disciple. But the primary role of the church, one family at a time, is to proclaim the gospel and replicate the process that is something that God gives the church, and then every other ministry head kind of partners with the local church, which is why we bring in people like Dr. Somke to partner with us. And so the test of the church is, are they making disciples? Not how many programs do they have, not how great is their bowling shtick, right? Not, not how, you know, it's like we, when we look at how our matrix of success is going at new life, we look at numbers, but the numbers have to represent actual discipleship. We don't just go, 
Oh, I mean, so one of our praise reports is there was 100 kids in the youth group last week. Praise God, right? But if all they did was come to youth group and text each other on their phones and, you know, Snapchat, and it wasn't gospel-centered, then it's fundamentally a waste of time, and they should go do something else with that hour and a half. They should ask for their life back. Or if you come here today, and this is a good club where you can just have some warm, happy-feely thoughts and meet some people and maybe do some networking and have some free donuts, you are missing it big time. This is not why New Life exists. We did not convert the old Gibson building and our downtown campus and things that are happening in Peru. We did not put all of this emotional work and energy into something so we can be a good club. We want to be gospel transforming. And so when we see people getting saved, when we see people getting baptized, when we see new churches that are new life starting, we celebrate all of those things because the test of a church is to make disciples And then if that's not the goal, it's a complete and utter waste of time. You have been bamboozled by the greatest scam in the last 2,000 years. But we know it is that central, that 4.5 billion people at least, and that's in the literature of the book you read, are walking around planet Earth with very little to no concept of Christ, even though they consider themselves religious. We know that over a billion people on planet Earth have never even heard the name of Jesus. So there's no time to waste. There's no plan B. He is the means in which we're saved and our life is transformed. And so what I want to do is transition this idea from last week into now where we're at in this discipleship series. Because last week is, this is what a disciple is. But this week, because what I know is that when the gospel takes root and people say, Jesus, I want to follow you, that it's like seeds that fall on different soils. And what I want to prepare you for this morning are very practical just understandings of what is going to derail the train. Maybe you walked in here for the first time last week, you heard the gospel, I never, I never really heard it like that before. I thought I was a Christian, but I, I don't know Jesus, and you gave your life to Christ, praise God. If that's you, or maybe in the last six months you made a decision for Christ, or maybe in the last 10 years you've followed Christ, or your whole life almost you've followed Christ, I want to prepare you and equip you in a disciple-making process by giving you some very concrete things to look out for. And so what I've decided to call the sermon today is, in the Disciple Maker series, Disciple Killers. There, there are three trained assassins in Scripture that are going to derail you in your faith. There, there are things that have been happening since before you were born, and I'm going to give them away now. One of the things that's going to derail you in your faith is what Jesus calls the world, and we're going to define that in a second. The second thing that's gonna derail you in your faith is you, your flesh. Christ died while we were yet sinners. And the bottom line is this, that sinners know how to do one thing really well. They know how to sin, and that's our flesh. That's our innate understanding or lack of understanding of who God is in our life because before we serve Christ, we will always serve one master in a different context, and that master that we serve is self. And then the third entity is the adversary of God, the hater of God, that is Satan, a fallen angel, and we're going to get to him as we close out. But I want to equip you in this time, because when you make a decision to follow Christ, what I want you to know is there are three trained assassins who are ready and willing and capable of going to war in your world. And so the first one is the world. And so here's what Jesus says. We're going to read a few verses from John chapter 15 about the world. He's very clear. He says, if the world hates you, verse 18, know that it has hated me before it hated you. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Remember what I told you week one? It's almost like in Jesus' earthly ministry at different points, he's trying to talk people out of being a Christian. Now, it's not actually what he's trying to do, but it seems that way because he's so upfront and it looks so different than modern American Christianity. It's, it's here, here's the good news. I'm going to die on the cross, but the good news is I'm going to rise again. The Holy Spirit's going to come. He says that in the Gospels, and then he, ha- he does it. But all throughout, when people come to him specifically with prideful hearts or religious hearts, it's like he's trying to talk them out of being a part of the kingdom of God. And so then he says this good news. Don't be surprised. You will will be hated. But it's specifically in the context of the people that are going to hate you aren't just a people. It's an ideology. It's the world. 
And so here's the Greek. And if you know me well and have sat under the teaching, you get about 10 Greek words a year. So savor this one. Ready? The Greek word for the world is the cosmos. It's where we get the, the word cosmetic, which means an arrangement of some kind. So the definition of the world is as follows. To organize something around a common thing. So how does that attach to cosmetics? It's like, a, I remember my grandma one time. She, she was a character, Grandma Johnson. She's gone on to be with Jesus. She was my dad's mom. And uh, she, she would put on her makeup in the morning when she'd come visit us. She had this muumuu that she would wear. And uh, I, she was my favorite grandma because she'd buy me all the sugar cereals. And she always let me light her cigarette in the back porch. And... <laughs> And she was like a World War II era, and it, it was a different time. And so uh, at the same time, she was like this charismatic woman, which is weird because I grew up Presbyterian, and she always told me that God was telling her things, and my mom always thought she was a little off her rocker. But that's another subject. But my grandma would say this to me. I remember one morning I woke up, and she said, I need to go put on my face. Have you ever heard that before? That's not really a Midwestern thing. This is, I wasn't from around these parts. But she'd say, I want to go put on my face. And, and then she would come back with just a lot of makeup on. And uh, my grandma Johnson, she was a character. But the idea is this, that, that she's going to put on her face, which means I'm going to organize my makeup in a way that I want you to see my face. It's a system of arrangement, the cosmos. That in, in the cosmos, there's order and there's orbit. And so when we think about ideas like the world will hate you, it's not necessarily that, you know, farm, Farmer Bill over there is going to hate you. It's the ideology hates you. It's the one that's crafting the ideology that hates you. It's a system of arrangement. So so here would be some examples. When we talk about politics, uh, it's the world of politics. What does that mean? That's not Capitol Hill. That's not the White House. That's the policies of politics, the candidates of politics, the platforms of politics, the debates that happen. It's it's not a location, but it's a system of arrangement around the idea of the world of politics. Or, Or maybe another example would be the world of finance. It's not money itself, but it's an economic system that governs the financial operations of society. It's the the world of finance. It's not necessarily the location of Wall Street. Or the world of sports, it's a system that helps us to, at a young age, to teach our kids how to worship false idols, right? It's the world of. It's why people sometimes in the fall have a lesser attendance rate at the second service because in the world of sports, they don't want anything to conflict with those Vikings and what time they play, Amen. It's the world of sports. And so a clear definition of the world that hates us, that hates Jesus, not a place but a system operating around a current theme. So who runs the system? Well, the Bible talks about our adversary, or Jesus' adversary. His name is Satan, the devil. And so what we know at New Life is every time we want to try to do something, because I'm kind of the ideas guy, where things tend to fail or succeed is based on the system management. So anytime you have a good idea or a vision for something, you can get it out of the gate, you can birth it, but if it does not have people on staff that are actually playing you know, quality control and running the system, then it fails. And so in this world, in this system, it has a leader, and his job is to kill, steal, and destroy, and he manages the system that keeps you out of an environment in which God moves. That's his job, and we're going to get to him as we close out the message. But just know this, Jesus is crystal clear. There's a cost to following me. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. It would be like saying, pick up your electric chair, this torture device, this instrument of death that's used for capital punishment, and follow me. And when you do that, here's how he's trying to talk you out of it, right? He wants to see who his true disciples are. And when you do that, just so you know, it's going to be tough. And the world, the system that governs, is going to hate you, not because of you, but because they hate me. Satan has a plan. He hates me. This is a chain reaction. So Jesus is crystal clear. People either loved him or hated him. But hear me say this, and I want you to look at me when I tell you this. No one ignored him. And no one slept during service. When Jesus talked, people listened because he was provocative and his words mattered. He was never ignored. The system was paying attention to Jesus. And so he says, you're going to be hated by the world. Here's another idea, that you're not called to be a friend of the world. Because to be a friend of the world is to make you an enemy of God, 
And here's a controversial statement that we can all wake up to. There are people that are sitting in church services, hopefully not new life right now, that are actually enemies of God because they've locked arms with the world. There are churches themselves who have locked, denominations that have locked arms with the world, and instead of saying, well, I'm gonna fall on the sword of what Jesus actually says, they fall on the sword of the latest you know, political movements of the day, and they're saying, well, we can just kind of change this or reorientate our beliefs on that because we want to be accepted and loved by the world and to be a friend of the world is to then be an enemy of God because the, the world is an enemy of God and you're guilty by association. And so he says, don't be surprised that the world hates you because they hate me. Anyone fish in here? I found that just stick to South Dakota analogies. Who's the best fisherman or fisherwoman in the crowd? Mike? It's not fireworks, but anything else? Like anyone, like you fish every day? We've had some people that fish, literally. Bob Marler, but you know, Bob, anyone who retires ends up fishing like a lot more. When you fish a lot, uh, you see something that happens, which is why I don't like to fish. I don't like to bait the hook. That's kind of gross. I'm not from around here, like I said, and I've been here 22 years, but that's kind of gross. And you know what else is even worse? Getting the fish out of the water. Because when you get the fish out of the water, it's slimy and it flops around, paranoid. Why? Well, the reason it's paranoid is because there's a reason that there's this cliche of, you know, it's like a fish out of water. When a fish is out of the water and into the boat, now all of a sudden it's not in its natural habitat. Its gills are flapping, its mouth's open, it's jumping, it's trying to survive because, and here's the tie-in, because it's operating in a system of a different world. And so we're in the world, but not of the world. And as we're in the world, we're not comfortable with the things that God is uncomfortable with. Just like someone who who comes in this space, hopefully they feel comfortable because they're loved, but as soon as they're confronted, they either need to surrender their life to Christ or they're gonna continue to feel uncomfortable. In fact, when I'm talking right now, if you feel uncomfortable and you're not a Christian, praise God, not because I want you to feel uncomfortable, because I know that's a catalyst and a platform for your life that's about to change. And so we feel like a fish out of water because we don't have an oxygen tank to to, to deep sea dive with. We have to have that then release valves because we have different values. And so here's, before we move on, here's the end goal of worldliness. The end goal of worldliness crafted by the head administrator, which is Satan, is to have you detach yourself from Jesus and also to then Detach from Jesus and attach yourself to their world system. Anything the enemy can do to, to get you to run from Christ and to, instead of to him is the end goal of worldliness. It's like a, a boat in the ocean. Right? So here's maybe, what does it mean to be in the world but not of the world? It's like a boat in the ocean or a boat at, at Richland Lake. And so you're, you're in the world or you're in the water and you're compassed, you're surrounded by it, but what happens when the boat sinks? What's going on? There's a hole in the boat and then what happens? The water comes into the boat and that's what it means to be in the world but not of it or a part of its system. And so you're in it, your boat is on the water, but the water's not in the boat. Are you tracking with that? Maybe a little mental picture for you to walk in, that you're in it but you're not of it. The water is around you but the water is not living inside of you because that space is governed by Jesus Christ. And when that space is not governed by Jesus Christ, the world will crush you. And so if you're a deep sea diver, what do you know about water? We we had a above ground pool that my dad dug about a three foot hole to have a deep end in. And everyone's got different pressure with their ears, right? But for me, if I get below four feet of water, I'm screaming bloody murder. And I know that's weird because that's not normal, but think of it in terms of a deep sea dive. What happens the deeper you go into the ocean? The pressure mounts, it mounts, it mounts. The point of if you go deep enough, literally your head can explode. Or it's like if you're in a submarine, you can only go so deep. But then what's the goal? Why can a submarine go deeper? It's because they have pressure release. There's a pressurized system in an airplane. There's a pressurized system uh, when you go into the depths of the ocean in a submarine. And so what happens is when we have the Holy Spirit to govern our lives and the world all around us, we're in this pressurized uh, system where we can now take on those things that are coming at us to be in the world but not of it. 
And so here, here's the second assassin. It's not anything that's outside of you, but it's actually what's living in your own heart. And the Bible calls this the flesh. And so here's something that we say at church if you're new. There's a few things. I'll just kind of say the same cliche things I always say, and my kids actually can just, like, repeat these things in a mocking fashion towards their dad. One of the things we say is this. If you're the problem, you can't be the solution because broken cannot fix broken. That's a counseling philosophy that I walk in. The reason that I will always counsel from a biblical perspective is because I know enough about life through scripture and also through just living it and watching people struggle that if the best thing I have for them is to them, for them to dig into the depths of their own soul to solve problems, I know they're cooked because they're not the solution. They're the problem, and the problem can't be the solution. And so the Bible is crystal clear on that. The definition of the flesh is the evil di- desires that live within These things have been going on for a long time since Adam and Eve took a bite of the apple. Sin entered into the equation. And at the core of your sin is what destroys everything in you and around you. It's this thing called selfishness. Because if you don't worship Jesus, you will always worship yourself or some form of self-worship. And so the flesh is raging. Paul talks about this as a paradox. And and he is perplexed at his own reality, even though he's an apostle. That that, that inside of you, before Christ, there's nothing you can do outside of Christ to be holy because he has to then place his righteousness on you. That's the gospel. That's why he goes to the cross. And when he goes to the cross, he takes away your sin nature in the sense that you still sin, but you sin less. You're not sinless, but you sin less. And so you have this sin nature, but he also gives you a new nature. And then the battle is raging. The adversary uh, in your heart is just absolutely in attack mode. L- let me just give you proof. If you, who in here is, can't wait till three o'clock? Why? Why? Bowling. What is it about bowling that's the most appealing if you have a young family? Thank you. You don't have hearts. No, I, I want some parents. No, I'm just kidding. That's exactly what I was trying to say. If you want to go at three o'clock, we're like, well, we need childcare. Why? Because bowling isn't that great unless you're, you know, kind of a different duck that just is obsessed with bowling and you're a subculture, right? Uh, if you have your own ball and your own shoes, you start to venture into the, the land of, you know, the extreme bowler. But for 98% of us that are going to go under 150 and we don't have the spin and we're not complaining that the lanes aren't oiled, uh, we are the normal people that go bowling once in a while. In that category, the most exciting thing is what? That at three o'clock, you have two hours away from your kids that you love so much. But let me just prove my point. The reason that sin nature is real, if it's not innate within you, who ever taught your kid how to lie? Who ever taught your kid how to throw a temper tantrum? I hold these truths to be self-evident. No one had to teach you how to sin. No one had to teach you how to look out for yourself first because we're a sin factory and we need a new nature. And when we get saved, The factory is closed for business. There's a new factory that takes control of your heart, but it's this thing that's going back and forth. You have to decide each day, each minute, each hour, who am I going to serve? Romans 6, Paul talks about this, and then in Romans 7, he says, this is my own conflict of my flesh. Verse 18, he says, for I know nothing good dwells in me. He says, that is my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. This is where he's perplexed. He says, for I do not do the good I want. Have you been there? Why can't I overcome this? Why do I keep falling back into this? I don't do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's saying this is the war that's raging, the trained assassin of self. There's a war in the flesh. There's a battle from within. I have a problem, Paul says, and the problem is living deep within me, and so I need something outside of me to save me from it, because broken can't fix broken. That's how sin works. Paul even says in a different text, oh, wretched man that I am. Here's specific ways that flesh operates. There's really just two ways, and I want you to write stuff down on your phones or on your bulletins. There's the way that the flesh works, and it's overt operations or covert, and overt is just we all know who you are because 
you're maybe the town pariah that is humbly walking into a church service. And I want you to know if that's your story, you have overtly sinned, there's a place for you at New Life because we're all broken. But overt sinners are the ones that are judged more harshly by the religious crowd. It's the, you know, I've had problems with addiction. I've had multiple relationships that have failed. I have kids that maybe I don't get to see the way I want to because when I was not living for Christ, there was a trail of tears in my path. It's kind of like the the story of the prodigal son. There's the older brother and the younger brother. The younger brother is the overt sinner. Everyone knows that he was swimming in pig slop and begging for just a piece of his father's pie when he comes crawling back to dad after wanting the inheritance. But then there's the covert flesh operations. That's the, I look pretty good and I'm pretty dressed up on Sunday mornings and I know how to shake hands and kiss babies and play the political role of religious guy or female. But Monday through Saturday, it's like, well, as long as I go to that confessional, depending on your background, metaphorically, then I'm good if I follow and jump through the right hoops. That's the way the flesh operates. It's selfish in nature. It's either overt or covert. The Bible says even our good deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord because that's how holy he is. The flesh is operating full time. And so here's what we do if we're operating specifically with overt or covert operations. What we try to do instead of crucify the flesh is we try to ride out this idea of flesh management. What does that mean? Flesh management is a tool that has been perfected by the religious. In fact, if if you are religious, here's a matrix for if you just need to surrender your life to Jesus, but you've been religious. When I ask you, well, how, how do you become a Christian? You simply tell me that you have to be a good person. You have to do things like go to church and maybe help out with Sunday school and maybe tithe a little bit or, you know, know, help your neighbor across the street or pay it forward at the drive-thru. And then in your mind, this is the eternal religious scale. And this is what's so scary about the scale because you don't believe that everyone's a good person. No one believes that if they're to be intellectually honest. But what you believe in your heart is if I do more good things than bad things, then the scale tips in my favor. And the scary part about that is what if it's really close and God's just keeping track? You know, here's a wait for the good thing. Here's a wait for the bad thing. And you get to heaven and it's like, oh, man, you just missed it. One more bad than good. Sorry. See you never. And so you're trying to manage that system of being a good person. And then what happens is you don't have victory over your sin because you never really repented of your sin and you've never given your life to Christ. And so what happens is you repeatedly are living in this war that's raging known as a sin cycle where you feel guilty and then you beat yourself up about it. You white knuckle it not to do it again because you're the sovereign ruler of your own life and you're gonna try harder to be better. And what you realize when you actually get into addiction circles is the whole model is built on surrender. That's the 12 steps. I am powerless over fill in the blank because the problem can't be the solution. And so you keep trying to, maybe, maybe your addiction, you know, you can imagine what it is. We all know the stats with, with sexual morality or issues like that. It's like, I'm gonna try harder. I'm just gonna please God this time. I'm not gonna let my family down. You make it about you know five, seven days, you fall again. You get into a disruptive cycle where you're condemning yourself and on and on it goes. And so the flesh management system was never intended to be the way that you overcome the flesh. How do you overcome the flesh? This could be like a three-part sermon series right now, but I'm gonna give it to you in a Reader's Digest version. You've got the adversary of the world. You've got the adversary of the flesh and the disciple-making process. How do you then override the system? Someone smarter than me brought this to light. The goal of disciple is not to manage the flesh, but to override the flesh, and they compared it to the law of gravity. And the law of gravity dictates what? What goes up must come down. Can you change the law of gravity? Not unless you leave planet Earth. Can you override the law of gravity? Yes. And it's the law of aerodynamics. See, the law of aerodynamics realizes this. Gravity is what gravity is. It's like Forrest Gump. It is, right? I don't know why I said that, but let's move forward, right? It's like like it is what it is. It's going to be there as long as you're on planet Earth. And praise God it is. We're not all floating around. And so if you want to go from location A to location B in a quick amount of time, you pay the ticket, you, you know, unless you're really wealthy, you have the private plane, you get on that plane and something happens. The, the engine 
has extra power because it's a jet engine. It has gasoline in it. And then the best part about flying is what, those first 10 seconds where all of a sudden you feel that force and, you, and you're going at an incredible rate because you have to defeat the law of gravity, although it's still there, and you have to speed up with enough power and enough speed so that you don't get rid of the law of gravity, you just override it. You're like, well, why are you talking about the law of gravity? Let me bring it back to the main point. The main idea is this. You can't cancel the law of gravity, but you can override it. You can't cancel the reality of the flesh and your sin nature, but you can override it by living by the Spirit. And so quit trying to do it on your own because you're the problem. The way that you have victory over sin is not by trying harder, but it's by serving Christ and giving him everything. To actually have joy in your heart by actually enjoying those things that you used to detest, like learning in his word and spending time. It's like, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to, but what if you, you get to? What if you get to be around the people of God, in the house of God, and, and go bowling with them, and share life's burdens with them, and open scripture with them, where you can actually override the flesh, not by you know, ignoring the law of gravity, but by overriding it, by living in the spirit and those things that God has allowed you to do that give you the victory in Christ. Are you tracking with that analogy? Give me a head shake if that makes sense, right? Do you get what I'm saying? We try harder instead of saying, I just wanna live by your spirit and actually enjoy these beautiful things that you give us like fellowship, like your word, like prayer. And now as I'm living in the spirit and the Holy Spirit's living in me, it's not that I uh, can't, it's not that I'm sinless, but I sin less because I'm excited about what God has for me. And Christianity is not just a list of do nots. For some of you, that might be just like not a big deal. For some of you, that is a life-changing piece of information. Because you keep going around the crazy train in the cycle of dysfunction in your life because you have not learned how to celebrate the reality of living by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so it's a way to override it. Here's the last piece of the triangle. The enemy has three main objectives in your life that as soon as you say yes to Christ, he's gonna attack. His three main objectives are clear in scripture. Jesus says them for himself. He wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy. He's known as the prince of this world. The backstory is that he wanted to be God. He was jealous of God. He was cast out of heaven. He would not submit to God's authority. He took a third of the angels. A third of the angels were kicked out with him. And ever since, he has been on a war path. And he's gonna leave you. He's not omnipresent and he's not all powerful. He's probably going to leave you alone based on time management if you're not following God. Or if you have said yes to Jesus, but you don't really want to do much for Jesus. He's got better things to do. But mark my words, when you start picking up that mantle and saying, Jesus, I want to live by the power of your Holy Spirit, and I want to be a disciple maker, you're going to get hit. This is what we learn about him in 2 Corinthians 11.3. He says, Paul, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve, that's Satan, by his cunning... Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion for Christ. And so he is going to use a means of disguise in your life. And disguise is going to take the form of deception. So I want to pause here for a second because we're getting close to closing. And I want you to just process that idea. That God is for you that he's provided a means of salvation and a new life that you can have in his son, Jesus, and that when you make that decision to follow Christ, you're gonna get hit. And the devil is not the pitchfork cartoon with the red jumpsuit that you've been told he is. That he is going to disguise himself specifically as an angel of light. He is gonna disguise himself as an angel of reason. He is going to disguise himself with a means of persuasion in your life where The worst thing in your heart is to be hated by the world and the system that corrupts. And so instead of running from the world or being in it but not of it, being a boat that doesn't have water in it, what you're gonna do in your flesh is you're gonna lock arms with his plan in your life because you are buying into the deception that he knows best for you. 
That's just what he does, and that's not going to change until he's thrown into what the Bible calls a lake of fire. His methodology is to deceive. His plan is to destroy, and he will disrupt any process of disciple-making that gets you operating in the Holy Spirit. And what he doesn't want for you is the victory that you have in Christ. And so he wants to pull you from that plan. I I would caution specifically, if you are a, a man who is married with children and you have said, Jesus, I choose this day whom I serve, he is going to try to infiltrate that process at every level because he knows that in your spiritual leadership in your home, you are going to disrupt change potentially for generations. He is coming after you. And that, that would be a terrible way to close. So here's the good news, that you can have victory in Christ. James, the half-brother of Jesus, will close with this text. It says this. Here, here's the victory. He says, submit yourselves to God. And then James says in verse 7, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So, so it's twofold. Here's the, here's the victory. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the flesh, operate in the spirit. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Here's the good news. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So here's the closing practical reality. The law of spiritual aerodynamics is When you move something with the right amount of power and the right amount of speed, you can defeat the enemy. And that's not from your own accord. That's by surrendering your life to the power of the Holy Spirit that operates within it. Here's the good news of the victory of the disciple. You don't have to be who you used to be. You don't have to live how you used to live. That you are expected, not just someone for a spiritual elite, you're expected to live in victory because, look at me when I tell you this, if you're new in the faith, the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. The same power. It's not like a second-rate, broken model of the version. When Jesus walked on earth, what do we see him do? Raise the dead. The, the, you know, the lame were healed. The deaf were healed. The blind were healed. But more importantly, all the spiritually broken were healed. And so you have that same power that rose Christ from the dead, living in you, when last week, maybe for the first time, you said, I want to, Jesus, be a follower of you. I want to pick up my cross and follow you, that I can have that victory, and you can break the law of spiritual aerodynamics in your life. And it happens one disciple at a time. I'm going to close with this story. The praise team better be ready, because we're about to close. It's 1030, and I know how you guys are, right? Let me close with this idea. Last week, I put before you a group of men that I saw God doing some awesome stuff in. And so this week I backed it up because they followed up with a text and I see something that's sitting in church right now. And then they, and one of them said to me, Marcus, who's at the second service, the note taker on the basketball team at Northern, he said, well, you know, you talked about this in church, just so you know, we're having Bible study this week. And so this Friday, uh, I went to the Northern basketball locker room and pretty much all the team, with the exception of a few who are out of town, were sitting there, Bibles open, just reading the Bible. I've known some of these guys for the first time, 10 minutes before or when I got there, the first 10 minutes I got there, I just met them. A couple of them I've known a few years. One I've known since they were little. In this circle of influence that they operate in, because basketball is different at Northern, every one of them is going verse by verse by verse by verse. And here's what they're saying. What does this mean? What did you get from that? Some of them probably been going to church their whole lives. Some of them maybe have never even just started But if you want to break the law of spiritual aerodynamics in your life, you want to rise above, well, how do you do that? You hold on to truth instead of lies, and you dig into the word of God, and you have fellowship with other people that are hungry for the move of God in their life. The reason I bring it to light, like the second week in a row, is I was shocked. I told them, I said, man, I've been in Aberdeen 22 years. There's all sorts of stuff that happens. I've never seen it quite like this. How many of you are starting to understand? There's God's raising up a generation. That's not me being a salesman. I'm being honest. I've been here. God's raising up a group of young people in Aberdeen that are hungry for the gospel, that are in positions of influence. And they're reading the word and they're asking the questions and you can see it kind of welling up in their hearts where they're saying, 
You know, Jesus, I want to follow you. And now, because they're tempted at every turn, especially being student athletes, they're tempted at every turn to fall off the cliff and the devil will attack them. But they're being equipped with power, not that the gravity stops to exist in the flesh and the world and the enemy attacking, but they're saying, I'm believing on the promises of scripture and I'm living by the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm believing for victory in my life and change happens one disciple maker at a time. This isn't me leading the study. This is an 18-year-old from Minnesota and his buddy from Iowa who's 21 and married. Sitting in church right now. We have the victory in Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for all the things that are happening here. Well, God, when we get to the core of why we exist, we are disciples who are disciple makers. And Jesus, again this week, for anyone that's in this space that is religious but not a follower of you, I pray that they would surrender their heart to you. And God, for the rest of us that we, we, we own the reality of what you did on that cross, but we are constantly getting hit by things that are having victory that we're supposed to be overcomers in. Help us to live by the power of your Holy Spirit and experience freedom through being disciples who are making disciples. We pray this in your name. Everybody said, amen. For some of you, we'll see you at three o'clock. We're gonna stand up. We have one more song. Um, you can, if you're new, I wanna meet you. I'm gonna be in the overflow area in just a second. If you go here, we wanna fund the mission and vision. We don't tithe in-house. We tithe, you can walk out the door and tithe in those boxes. You can tithe online. Uh, but at this time, we're gonna sing one more song. You can go get a book at the info booth as well.